So, all right, let's start talking about material then. So yesterday we had started getting into plasticity. How many of you have actually seen plasticity in any of your coursework before? Or looked into plasticity theory at all? Okay, cool. So this is presumably new stuff. Um, so yesterday we had talked uh, about different constitutive models for plasticity. Um, and there was a couple things that I wanted to go back to that I didn't really talk about to give you some physical insight. So we talked about, so you, before uh, we talked about if you have a material stress strain response, we pretty much talked about this initial linear elastic part of the curve and we hadn't talked about yet when, when and why this happens and uh, what happens afterward. And so now with this tension lab, you're starting to get into some of that. Um, and you'll either have, you could have a brittle response and the material could just break there. You could have an elastic perfectly plastic. You can model it as a piecewise hardening. You can model, as a, model it as a hardening response. Generally materials, especially metals, when you test them will have some hardening response. Um, and if you were to go and unload this part of the way through, you would get an elastic response back down that would have the same slope as your initial slope. So you have some Young's modulus there. If you were to unload it, you would presumably get something similar, a similar type of Young's modulus. And so this plastic, deforma plastic deformation, then elastic deformation back down. And if you were to load the material back up, you would come back along the same loading line. So that means if I, if I were to go through a stress strain response, I would have a material that deformed elastically, deformed plastically. I could unload it along this path, uh, up, down, and then I would could then load it back up, and I would come back along that same loading path, and it would continue. This is kind of a, a very idealized curve. Um, really, what would probably happen is is this would have some hysteretic effects. You you wouldn't get it be perfectly the same so this may kind of loop around uh, and come back roughly like that depending on any if there's any time dependence but physically what's happening so so this hardening behavior is particularly interesting from a material perspective uh, because it correlates with the change in orientation of the material microstructure so this hardening behavior is actually due to so yesterday we had shown some grain rotation and some dislocation motion as those grains rotate, um, they start to realign themselves in the direction of the principal stresses or of the applied stresses. So here, what you're basically getting is is as you as you go from something that's here to something that's more pulled out under tension, and as you're plastically deforming it, you start with some grains that are sort of I don't know randomly oriented in whatever ways. Um, and as you stretch it, they kind of start to realign a little bit in that direction of applied stress. So this actually, phys physically what you're doing when you're applying a uniaxial tension test is you're cold rolling your material, or you're cold working your material. So um, cold rolling, uh, when you take a sheet and you put it through two big rollers and it kind of thins it out, you're doing that in, in essence with this uniaxial tension test. And so this hardening behavior you see is due to the realignment of the grains in the direction of tension. Um, and you're kind of stretching them out and realigning them in that orientation. Similar to polymers, polymers remember are molecular, molecular spaghetti, maybe there's some crystalline parts of that spaghetti, um, but when you pull it, those molecules will all realign in the direction, in the direction of your principal stress. Of your, uh, if you're applying <coughs> the axial tension, they'll align in the, ten, in the tensile direction. Which is why when you take a rubber band, for example, and you pull it a little bit, it's pretty stretchy, but when you start pulling it a lot, it stiffens up. And so that hyperelastic response is all of the rubber molecules realigning in the direction that you're pulling it. Um, and so what that means, actually, there's another interesting phenomena that I didn't mention. So this, this hardening behavior is due to microstructural reorientation. There's an interesting phenomena called the Bauschinger effect. Schinger effect. And what that is, is when I apply uniaxial tension to my material, so 
stress, strain. I'm going to apply some stress. I'm going to have some yield point. Sigma yield in tension. That's a T. Is that a little bit small? That might be a little bit small. Uh, I don't know if I can make it much bigger. Yield and tension. Cool. Uh, there's going to be some plastic behavior, and then if I unload this, it's going to come back down there with the same slope, roughly the same slope. Uh, and then I'll, if I start compressing it afterward, uh, what I'll end up, ha what'll end up happening in compression, I'll, I'll get a similar sort of yielding eventually. And this I'll call my sigma yield compression. What's, what's actually going to happen is this sigma yield compression is generally, or the, the magnitude of it, I guess because it's technically negative, uh, the magnitude of it is less than the yield in tension. This is the absolute value of these two. So because of this microstructural reorientation, I'm actually making it stronger in tension in the direction that I'm pulling it and weaker in compression in the direction that I'm pulling it. So this, this tension compression asymmetry after work hardening is known as a Bauschinger effect. Um, and I think this is, there's a small chapter on it in your book that goes into a little bit more detail. Um, but it's, it's a particularly interesting one because it mirrors what's happening in the material as you're deforming it. Um, so from an engineering design standpoint, where this is useful, so this, this hardening effect is particularly useful if you have a component that you know is going to undergo stress. So say, I don't know, you have part of an airplane wing and you know right at the joint of the wing as it's flexing it's going to be really highly stressed and it might see some plastic, uh, plastic straining, uh, plastic deformation. What you can assume, or what you would assume as an engineer is that okay, I, I'm using a certain metal alloy that I know has this hardening behavior, and I know it's not going to exceed, I don't know, whatever stress. I, I want it to stay below my yield stress, my, my yield stress for the material, but I know it might go a little bit higher. But if it does, it'll harden, and it'll actually harden in, that, uh, in, in the direction of the tension. So after that first couple of loading cycles, um, it's going to end up back up here at some higher stress, but then that new stress will all be elastic and it will have become stiffer, or it'll become, it'll have become stronger in that direction because of the work hardening. The counter to that is if it ever doesn't experience a load in that direction, it'll actually be weaker because of that microstructural reorientation. Cool. So that was a point that I thought was interesting and important that I didn't really talk about much yesterday. Questions? For this one? Yeah, after it's under, undergone the, the hardening, uh -huh. the new elastic modulus, that would be, uh, or, oh, so, it's just changing so we, the... So we assume that the modulus stays about the same. Um, technically, it would change a bit because of that reorientation, but the amount that it changes is, is insignificant compared, particularly compared to how much the yield strength can change. So it'll be like maybe a couple percent different, but it's not... It's, it's almost within the, the margin of error for the measurement anyway. Uh, yeah, so we, we just assume that E is the same, which for metals is generally fine. For polymers might not be as fine. It depends on how much plastic deformation there is. If you have something that's undergoing like 80% plastic deformation, plastic strain, it's probably not a valid assumption to say that modulus stays the same, but this is like... I don't know, two, three, four percent strain. It's, it's okay. Cool. Other questions or thoughts? Concerns? This plasticity thing really scares me. I don't know what's going on. Um, okay. So I'm going to pick back up where I, or pick back up on on the yield surfaces that I discussion that I would started yesterday, and I'm going to go through it in a slightly more sensical way than I had done last time. So I'm going to talk about yield criteria. Uh, 
And before we talk about yield criteria, I want to just really quickly go back to principal stresses because this is an important component of this. So we have four stress, our, our stress tensor or our stress matrix, depending on what you want to call it. Um, y, Z, X, Z, X, Y, uh, and this is symmetric. I know that in some converted coordinate system, I can say that there's some true, uh, some, some max in, in my principal stress orientation. I can say that there's some principal stresses, two and three, uh, where this matrix is diagonal, uh, where uh, here I have some, some arbitrary stress <coughs> on, on some body stress, stress. Uh, I'm only going to draw it in two dimensions, but pretend it's in three. X, X, Y, Y. And then in some other orientation, I can say there's actually some principal stress acting on this. Sigma one, sigma two. One, these are orthogonal to each other. And in this orientation, there's no shear component. Uh, and there was a couple transformation equations that we'd had for that. We can look at it in terms of our Moore's circle or in terms of those stress transformation equations that we had had. Um, so the stresses, those principal stresses in terms of the other stresses, uh, x, y over two, uh, square root of, I'm gonna say one and two here, and say this is plus or minus, sigma, x minus sigma y over 2 squared plus sigma xy squared here. Cool. And now if I look at that in a more circle, I'm going to say this is some shear, this is some axial stress, this is my principal stress one, my principal stress two, meh, principal stress two, uh, and I have a maximum shear stress along that top point. So my max shear stress tau max or uh, if I wanted to say sigma x, y max uh, is my sigma x plus sigma y over two, or my sigma one minus sigma, or sigma one minus, 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 yep. Minus sigma y over two, or sigma one minus sigma two over two in two dimensions. In three dimensions, I have a slightly different situation because I have to consider the stress in the third direction. And so this is for, for 2D, for 3D, uh, we have to remember that there's actually a third principal stress here that we're ignoring if both of these are positive, um, and we're assuming there's no stress in the third direction, that third direction stress would actually be zero. So I can actually say my tau max is the uh, sigma, my principal stress, or my max, uh, sigma, I, I, how do I want to write this? Is the max sigma i minus the min sigma i over 2, which is just in 3D my sigma 1 minus sigma 3 over 2. If I take sigma 1 to be greater than sigma 2 to be greater than sigma 3. 
four principal stresses. So generally speaking, in, in two dimensions, we can we often ignore that third direction of stress, but in three dimensions, we actually have to start considering that to figure out what our max stress is relative to our principal stresses. Cool. So I wanted to give a brief reintroduction of that principal stress concept before we started jumping into yield surfaces. Yeah. Uh, this is just the max axial stress. Sorry. So this would be x, x, y, y, z, z, um, depending on which orientation you're looking at. Yeah, but really it's, it's simpler to just think about it in terms of principal stress. Um, but I guess uh, we didn't really talk about more circle in 3D at all. Had you all seen? Yeah. Why is sigma 2 incorporated in the equation? So uh, if, we, if we looked at this in a more circle space, what you would have is some stresses out like this. Stress, shear. So, so, have you all seen more circle in three D, or who who has, or maybe who hasn't seen more circle in three D? Okay, cool. So, uh, yeah, we didn't really cover it earlier in the class. I don't. So, so. Mm. If we wanted to find what our principal stresses were in 3D, generally I would expect you to do an eigenvalue analysis, which we also haven't talked about much in this class because these transformation equations get kind of wonky in 3D. Um, so all of your problems will actually involve stress in 2D. But in 3D, if we were to draw out a Mohr circle in 3D, sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, what you would actually have is before we had only been looking at principal stress in the one and two directions, there's actually, uh, if you wanted to write out the third direction, you could represent it graphically as this. Uh, and so you would have some max shear strains along different directions. Um, so sigma x, x, x y, y, z, uh, x, z. Uh, and the maximum between those would be the sigma one minus sigma three, so the absolute max shear stress, um, where, yeah, it's, it's relative to your, to your maximum and minimum principal stresses. I don't know if this is actually helping much at all, though, and it's probably making it more confusing because we didn't actually talk about it in 3D. Um, yeah. So I'm just going to say don't worry about it for now. <laughs> just take me at my word that it's it's one my the maximum shear stress is the maximum minus the minimum principal stress here because <coughs> I don't have a better explanation off the top of my head um, okay cool so actually first other questions other concerns before we jump into yield surfaces okay so what I want to know now is for a slightly more complicated state of stress. So for a uniaxial stress strain curve, I have, or like a uniaxial tension test, uh, pure shear test, I would have some <coughs> modulus, some yield point where the, where the material starts to fail. So this is failure happens. But what, what about if I have that arbitrary state of stress? What if I have, most of the time you're not gonna be taking a single uniaxial bar and, and pulling or pushing on it in an engineering context. You're going to have some complicated structure that you're bending and twisting and you have some weird state of loading somewhere arbitrarily on the body. And we want to figure out at that arbitrary point on the body, is it going to fail or not? And so we need to figure out, we need to come up with a failure criteria or a set of failure criteria to define when that failure is going to happen. So the simplest of these failure criteria is the maximum stress criteria. Uh, 
which I started talking about a little bit. Maximum stress criteria. Or I guess maximum normal stress. Sorry. Maximum normal stress criteria. Criterion. Criterion. Because it's singular. Um, so with the maximum normal stress, I'm going to say I'm going to pull my stress into some principal stress formulation, sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3. And I'm going to say if any of these surpass my yield strength, so if uh, any sigma 1, 2, or 3 is greater than um, my tension, so well, I guess in general I'm going to go with the convention that sigma 1 is greater than sigma 2 is greater than sigma 3 and I'm going to say if my sigma 1 is greater than my some yield and tension uh, or if my sigma 3 is less than some yield in compression then this goes to failure and what that means graphically is I have uh, do I want to write this out in 3D? I'm going to write this out in 2D. 2D. Two 2D. Two mm. Mixing this up all again. Mm. Okay. So, I'm going to say if, if any of these if I ignore that so I'm going to say if any of my principal stresses surpass the yield strength and tension or uh, are, are greater than the yield strength and tension or less than the yield strength and compression then failure will happen so what I'm going to write out now is a map of principal stress space so I'm going to have some sigma 1 some sigma 2. Um, I'm going to ignore this for now because I don't actually want it there yet. Um, and I'm going to say now if I have some sigma yield in tension, some sigma yield in tension, some sigma yield in compression, some sigma yield in compression, sigma yield and compression. I'm going to have some stress sigma 1, 2, and 3. So technically this is a there's a box and this is a third direction, third dimension. If my so so say I have some stress, yeah, sure, that lies outside of this failure bound. So my uh, my principal stress 1 is greater than my yield intention. My uh, principal stress 2 is is less than that yield intention. All I care about is that one of these has surpassed it. So I say failure happens if I lie outside of that bound. Uh, and if I'm inside it, or either way, if I lie outside of that bound. So it, now if my sigma 2 is greater than my yield intention, um, then it also fails. If, I, if both of those materials are inside of that, then it survives. Survives. Both of these are failed. Um, conversely, if, if either of these is uh, if either of these has a is below the principal stress and is, has a, if either of these principal stresses is less than my compressive yield strength, then failure will happen out here. If I have one compressive stress, one tension, one tensile stress, I won't necessarily fail. And so, what that looks like is if I start applying some sort of a biaxial stress on a body. If I just look at this in 2D, sigma 2, sigma 1, sure, sigma 1. Um, I need to know what my stresses are in my 1 and 2 direction, and if either of them exceeds the yield in tension or the yield in compression, then failure happens. This is a very simple stress criteria, basically the same as if, so in, in uniaxial uh, tension, I would say if I, if my if my stress in uniaxial tension exceeds the yield stress, then failure starts to happen. 
um, here now it just generalize it to a square to two different directions uh, this is actually a little bit too simple of a, of a failure criteria for most materials uh, except for ceramics so actually brittle materials are you can model reasonably well with the maximum stress criteria so um, the tricky bit is there's actually normally an asymmetry for brittle materials so this is where I was trying to go yesterday but started to mix things up um, so say I have some brittle material with a whole bunch of flaws in tension that brittle material will fail via a crack propagating through the material so in tension <coughs> tension then my material ends up fracturing into two pieces and it'll start fracturing in two pieces if either of these stresses exceeds the yield strength and tension in compression and, and generally that will fail catastrophically in a, in a brittle manner in compression because brittle materials are governed by flaws uh, I don't actually have so the, these cracks in compression will still start to grow and move but they'll start to grow and move in shear instead of in tension and what I'll end up with is a failure surface that is at some diagonal oriented um, to the 45 to a 45 degree angle relative to the maximum principal stresses so it'll, it'll fail along a direction of maximum shear instead of maximum tension and this is important because this asymmetry actually leads to kind of orders of magnitude differences in failure strengths so if I were to look at this and this here so if I were to look at something like glass so the window glass that's out there which is uh, soda lime glass glass which is like 90% of all the glass that's out there um, my soda lime glass uh, my yield strength in tension or my ultimate strength in tension is around 50 get 50 megapascals um, but my yield strength in compression is something on the order of one gigapascal so there's about a two order of magnitude difference between the failure strength in tension and in compression uh, and so what that yield surface would look like now is in my stress space my stress one stress two I would have a teeny tiny box out here where the yield strength is in tension and I would have a very long box out this way that's the yield strength in compression so if either of these stresses in the x or y direction, if, I, if I'm applying a stress to this body now, some stress in the one direction, some stress in the two direction, if either of these exceeds that tensile strength, um, which is fairly low, then failure will happen. But in compression, I can kind of keep going for a long time before failure happens. And if I have biaxial compression, then I can compress it even more. Um, before failure will start to go and it doesn't really matter these two don't necessarily interact all that really matters is is whether that failure either of these exceed one or the other cool That's yeah specifically for brittle materials with a lot of infections or yes generally um, so this would be applicable for e even something like a carbon fiber composite or glass or um, any engineering ceramic uh, because those materials generally fail in tension via flaws and so that this th that mechanism for sh uh, shear driven failure doesn't really exist or isn't as pronounced I guess, I guess under what circumstances could I not Is sufficiently brittle material, is there any circumstance under which I could assume that it wouldn't fail that way? Mm. If it was, so the only time where it would actually, where this sort of criteria wouldn't really hold for brittle material is if you made it not brittle by like raising the temperature. So ceramics at elevated temperatures can have some ductility um, because when you raise the temperature, it uh, reduces some of the bonding strength between the materials and they 
you can have dislocation motion or crane sliding a little bit easier. Um, and that would sort of break down this assumption. But flaw-driven failure for a brittle material, then this is generally what you would be looking at. All right, so the next criteria, which is a slightly more uh, uh, thoughtful, or not slightly more, brings a little bit more consideration into, into the failure, is a maximum shear stress criteria. So maximum shear stress criteria. <laughs> So this is also known as a Tresca criteria, or Tresca yield criterion, uh, criterion, I can spell. And this was developed in 1864 by, I think he was a French mathematician, or French engineer. I guess they were all mathematicians back in the day, 1864. Um, so this criteria is better for ductile materials. So for ductile materials. And basically what it says is, now if I have some stress on a body, what I want to actually know is not just what the uniaxial stress is, but what the, what the shear stress is. So uh, let's say I'm applying some stress in the one and two direction, one, two. Uh, I'm actually gonna say failure occurs when the maximum stress is greater than or equal to the yield stress in shear. So you would get this, um, for example, from a from a torsion test or an Iosopescu test. Um, the torsion testing lab that you're doing in two weeks um, will go through a shear failure criteria. So in this, now we have to look back at what our principal stresses are. So now this. Um, now this principal stress, or the, this, wh what I'm looking for when I'm trying to find this maximum shear stress. Let's write this out a little bit better this time. Um, my max stress is one half the max of sigma one minus sigma two, sigma one minus sigma three, and sigma two minus sigma three. So if these are all of my principal stresses, it's one half the absolute value of those two subtracted from each other. Or generally, if we take the convention um, that sigma one is greater than sigma two is greater than <coughs> sigma three, then this becomes just one half sigma one minus sigma three. Yeah. Um, and so now I can say uh, because failure is going to occur when I when I hit the max of one of these, what I'm going to look at now in my failure space do, do, is I have my sigma one, my sigma two. Uh, if I keep my sigma two at a constant value or keep uh, sorry, intention here at a constant value. Uh, when one starts to change sign, when the other starts to change sign, the other starts to change. What I end up with is a yield surface that looks something like this. So now, um, basically, if, if one of my principal stresses is above my yield stress, so this would be my sigma yield uh, intention. Because this is a ductile material, we generally don't assume there's a ton of asymmetry, but you can have asymmetry for certain types of materials. This one, I'm gonna ignore it for now. Um, if my 
uh, max stress one here. So now I, I could say uh, my sigma yield here, I'm going to assume that my, my tau yield is, uh, my tau yield is equal to sigma y over two. So if I were just applying a uniaxial stress and I had no shear stress, mm, let's do this. If I were applying a uniaxial stress, um, then I would get when sigma one, sigma one is equal to sigma yield, uh, then failure starts to occur. And if I were to use that relationship, I would say tau is equal to sigma one minus zero over two, which is just then my yield strength tau y is sigma y over two. So here, if, if my principal stress exceeds that in either of these directions, then failure starts to occur. Um, when my other stress starts to go negative, then I'm actually getting a higher, I actually have a little bit less room to move because I'm subtracting a negative. So I, I don't have as much uh, wiggle room here. It actually starts reducing this value. And so where my maximum normal stress criteria was kind of something out like this, now my Tresca criteria shaves off these corners and says, okay, well, now if I'm inside here or outside here, inside here, outside here, inside here, um, these are all failing, failing, and these ones are all surviving. But there's a slightly tighter bound now over where that failure is going to happen. Cool. Questions, thoughts on that? All right. So the Tresca criteria is, is a useful one for ductile materials. It turns out there's one that's slightly more accurate that is a little bit more difficult to calculate out. And that's what's known as the von Mises yield criteria. So let's talk about von Mises yield criteria. So this historically is a little bit newer. It's developed around 1913 uh, by a guy von Mises. I, th I think he was German or Austrian, but don't hold me to that because I don't actually remember right now. Um, but this is slightly more rigorously form a, a, a more regular rigorously formulated version of of a shear yield criteria. And so, what this criteria is also known as is a max distortion energy criteria. Max distortion energy criterion. So what this theory assumes is that if I have a hydrostatic compressive stress on a material, if I have a hydrostatic stress on a material, that won't cause any failure. So if I took, I don't know, a block of aluminum and I dropped it down to the bottom of the ocean and it was under, I don't know, whatever, hundreds of hundreds or thousands of atmospheres of pressure, it wouldn't actually deform at all plastically. It would just kind of compress and then when I brought it back up, it would pop back to its original shape, um, which may be a valid assumption, may not quite be a valid assumption. But so that hydrostatic stress now uh, I can calculate in a material as the sum or the, the sum of the axial components in that material uh, or the average of the, the sum of the axial stresses. So hydrostatic stress, sigma h now is sigma x plus sigma y plus sigma z all over three. And so what I'm going to define now is something called a deviatoric stress. So let's say deviatoric stress, which is the stress that I had originally <coughs> minus all of those hydrostatic components of stress uh, along the diagonal. So this now, this deviatoric stress is just going to be the part of the stress that's causing shear to happen. 
so deviatoric stress, um, stress that causes distortion, <coughs> which I could write out and say this is sigma x minus sigma h, sigma y minus sigma h, sigma z minus sigma h, sigma y, z, x, z, x, y, h, h. These are all h's. Um, and what I do now is I try to take the determinants of that deviatoric stress. So um, from that deviatoric stress, I, I want to now say, uh, I want to relate my, my failure stress to that. And I can say, my failure happens, failure occurs when when my yield strength is, or when, when the stresses are greater than or equal to the yield strength, uh, I want this to be three halves the deviatoric stress squared as a single component. And so what that ends up being, uh, if I do some math, do some math that I'm not going to write out for you because it's kind of long and gross and matrix mathy, um, is in terms of my normal stresses, I can say failure occurs when, <sighs> all right, uh, this is going to be kind of long, one half, failure occurs when this sigma xx minus sigma yy squared plus one half x minus z squared plus one half uh, sigma y z squared. Oh, geez, that's going to keep going. Three. Sigma xy squared plus sigma xz squared plus sigma yz squared. There we go. Yes. I ran out of room on the page. So it's this whole big long expression, or in terms of my principal stresses, which is slightly simpler to write out, failure happens when this is one half sigma one minus sigma two squared plus uh, sigma one half sigma two minus sigma three squared plus one half uh, sigma one minus sigma three squared. There we go, which is slightly simpler because then I get rid of all these shear components and I'm writing things in terms of one, two, three instead. So now um, I can figure out how this relates to my shear stress uh, by saying if I had a pure shear applied to the material. So if I had a pure shear, then I have stress is just that shear there, which means my von Mises stress, uh, I could say that's sigma y is less than or equal to, there's a whole bunch of zeros, plus zero, zero, uh, plus three tau yield squared, um, plus some zeros, plus some zeros. So I can now say that this, uh, I can relate my sigma y to my shear yield as the square root of three times my shear yield. So um, this is a slightly more accurate prediction for how uh, uniaxial, sh uniaxial yield strength relates to shear yield strength. What it looks like now, cool. there we go. What this looks like now in my stress space in 2D is I have a continuous surface. So the, the reason this is convenient 
is because for that von Mises criteria, I have, I'm looking for the max of whatever these differences between the stresses are. So it's, it's discrete and I get sharp lines and I have to uh, take a max of different values. This now I get a single value out for my stress. So I can take that complicated stress tensor and I just throw it into here and I get one number. And that one number corresponds to whether failure is going to occur or not. And so what that looks like now is I'm gonna draw out um, my Tresca from before, Tresca from before, and the von Mises is actually a slightly uh, elongated continuous version of this surface. There we go. So this is my von Mises criteria where that inner dash line is my Tresca criteria. This is still my sigma one and sigma two. And so now this, this is a much more accurate way of representing how, how and when failure is going to occur. And in, for a ductile material, this turns out to be a very valid uh, equation to use to figure out when uh, yielding will happen. So actually, if you look at finite element solvers, um, generally what it will report to you is the von Mises stress. So if you remember uh, when I showed that, that W that I had stressed uh, in class, I don't know, last week, um, I showed the stress one, two, three, or the principal stresses one, two, three, maximum shear uh, stresses in the one, 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 two, one, three, two, three directions. Uh, but the first thing on that list was actually the von Mises stress, uh, because generally this is the most useful quantity to be looking at when you're thinking about yielding. So now I can say for some arbitrary applied stress state, if I have some x, y, z in whatever directions, I don't just have to think about doing that uniaxial test. I can relate that yield strength, that sigma y that I get from my uniaxial, tank, my uniaxial test, or a, a shear yield strength that I get from a, from a pure shear test or torsion test, and say for that arbitrary stre stress state, if I am inside this yield surface or outside this yield surface, then I have then my material will or won't fail, or will fail or won't fail. First, cool. Uh, tomorrow we'll go through some examples on some of this too. Wait, sorry, you said failure occurs within. Sorry, failure occurs when I'm when I'm, my stress exceeds this yield surface. So when I'm outside, I mix that up. Yeah. So here, this is this is a failure, and this is a survival. Any other last minute questions? <coughs> All right, so tomorrow we'll go through a couple examples of how you would use this in practice if, for a couple simple cases of loading. Um, but, yep, but.